Welcome to uh, Moroff Medical Office Resources of Florida. My name is Dorothy Mowbray. I am uh, one of the board of directors and on the media committee chairperson, and I also represent a company here in Altamont Springs called Roar Internet Marketing. Today we have a very educational presentation on a controversial topic, 2019 Florida Medical Marijuana Update. Now, when, for those of you that will be watching this video, we want you to realize that there's a description area below, and you can find an interactive directory with a link to the topic that we discuss and also provide links to some other uh, videos related to this topic as well. Morif is a resource for all the healthcare professionals that can bring value to really any topic that is going to affect the business of your medical practice. So um, if you have questions or you have comments, uh, there are a lot of resources that Morif has to offer with these type of videos all archived on the website and on our YouTube channel. And we encourage you to go to morif.net or uh, like our YouTube channel to see all the other videos that we have done. As far as this particular topic, topic goes, keep in mind that Morif does not support or endorse any position, but rather would like all healthcare to better understand the legislative updates that affect healthcare. Just to give a little recap on, on kind of the history that's led up to the medical marijuana. In 2016, Florida voters overwhelmingly approved a constitutional amendment that legalized medical marijuana. Lawmakers then implemented legislation in 2017 to carry out the wishes of the voters. In the first nine months of 2018, approximately 136,000 patients statewide received marijuana certificates from their doctors, according to the Physician Certificate Pattern Review Panel. Rolling out Florida's medical marijuana legislation effort has been slow for many reasons. One reason that lawmakers have pointed to is the lack of research and data. Lawmakers and industry experts say the lack of research is largely because of the federal government has continued to categorize uh, marijuana as a Schedule I drug. The presentation will show how Florida and other states have adopted legislation so everyone who can have some more research on the positive and negative effects of marijuana for people who are ill. So I'd like to introduce our speaker, Michael Patterson. He is a healthcare executive with over 25 years of experience, which makes him a subject matter expert in the global cannabis industry and senior living industries with the Garam Lehrman Group and Guidepost, a licensed nursing home administrator and occupational therapist in four states. Mr. Patterson is an editorial board member of the American Journal of Medical Cannabis, medical cannabis contributing writer for the Orlando Medical News and member of the board of directors for the Tourette Syndrome Foundation. So with a warm welcome, let's greet Michael. Thank you. <laughs> they have me on stage today. Oh, the, the microphone works. That's good. That's good. I'm going to stand on this side. How's everybody doing today? It's exciting to talk to healthcare people. I like talking. I do a lot of sp uh, uh, seminars and uh, speaking engagements across the United States. I always love coming back to healthcare. Um, as they were saying in my introduction, I'm a licensed nursing home administrator and occupational therapist in Florida, as well as three other states. Um, I used to run the Avante Group nursing home chain. If you ever heard of that, I was chief operating officer. So uh, I've been in uh, nursing homes. I've actually run pharmacies here in the state through a company called Doctors Choice Pharmacy. I've uh, worked in the laboratory industry, uh, home health care. So I'm very familiar with what all of you do. And I understand your reservations um, about cannabis. And my goal is to kind of educate today about what is the law, what are the rules, how does this work, and then how can my, my company benefit from this. There's a lot of opportunity in the healthcare space for cannabis. And a lot of businesses, what I find in healthcare, they're very standoffish. Like, well, this isn't real healthcare. You know, if it's not covered by Medicare, it's not real health care. Um, but what we see is what I call a, the prohibition hangover. People who do not get on board with this now, they're going to be left by their competitors moving forward. And there's a lot of different ways. And we'll talk about that. One thing about Moroff, um, I like to mention, this is a perfect topic for Moroff. Moroff brings all the groups together from health care. This is something brand new. So now all health care needs to figure out how are we going to deal with this in our different uh, realm of healthcare. So uh, a little bit about me, 25 years as I said, um, I'm old. Um, 
1994, I got my occupational therapy license here in Florida and moved to the state from North Carolina. Um, I've been working in uh, cannabis now for going on six years. And let me tell you, when I sat there and did some of my first speaking engagements in 2014, talking to a group like this, I got a lot of looks like, what are you doing? You're going to ruin society. Now everybody's like, oh, that's so interesting. Oh, my goodness. Tell me all about it. So the learning curve is definitely caught up. And so it's interesting to see. We do a lot of work with uh, consulting in a lot of different states. Um, I was just in Oklahoma meeting with the Attorney General, um, leader of the House, leader of the Senate. They're looking to pass cannabis legislation. They had a, a, a constitutional amendment vote. Um, and so we were talking to them about different strategies in that respect. And so we actually uh, got a chance to educate uh, other groups with the, the FBI. Uh, we actually work with state health departments because our feeling is that U.S. cannabis um, is our mission statement is to move society forward through legalized cannabis. There's a lot of picks and shovels out there that people don't see, and those need to work in order for the cannabis industry to work. Banking, compliance, Little things like that. As we all know in healthcare, you have to have that compliance for this to work. So also I work with uh, the American Journal of Medical Cannabis. That's going to be a new magazine. We talked about research. There's not enough research. It's the first national magazine that's coming out this summer that's going to post research from all over the world in cannabis. Um, we have uh, editor-in-chief, Dr. Jahan Macau, And so he's going to be the curator for that. I will have a column that I'll be writing more about regulatory issues, legal issues, because for physicians, the biggest thing that we see is they don't know the law. They don't understand how it works. So if you're in a state like Missouri that just passed uh, in, in November, you're going to have a lot of doctors coming to the system. They're worried about, what about my liability insurance? What about uh, me and the rest of my company? What about well, my Medicare dollars? Am I going to lose those? And so the goal of, of American Journal of Medical Cannabis is to educate physicians and to mainstream this to more people can benefit from the medication. Okay, a little bit about U.S. cannabis. As I talked about, we do a lot of strategic advising. Um, we, we just worked with a company, or we keep, continue to work with a company um, that is in the cryptocurrency space, the token space. A lot of people don't understand that, that space. I'm learning a lot about it. Um, they just received a letter from a state agency, um, the first one in the United States that I'm, avail uh, that I'm aware of, that allows you to pay your state taxes with a cryptocurrency if you're a cannabis provider which is huge. So this is something to where if you're in a state that doesn't have banks and you're trying to pay your taxes, you don't have to load up cash and go all the way to the state office and pay in cash. You can pay automatically and the technology is now working to where you can sit there and every transaction, it automatically pays the state. You don't have to do anything. And so for cannabis businesses, that's huge. They don't have to pay to, to, to keep all the cash, to store all the cash in the vaults, to pay the armored cars. So our goal is to help companies survive and thrive in this new industry. Um, we do a lot of writing assistance for cannabis and hemp laws. We'll actually go into different states um, where they'll let us and, and help guide. Um, one of the things we're trying to work on this session in Florida is putting a tax on medical marijuana. What do you mean there's no tax? Right. We're funding all this, okay, where there's no revenue coming in. Now, the medical marijuana treatment centers here, they have to pay a fee every two years, a licensing fee, that's right now between sixty and seventy thousand dollars. That's not paying all the bills, and that's not a sustainable system. So we're working on trying to get some sort of tax to where we can put in funding for the Department of Health, who oversees this program. If you don't have funding for your regulatory group, you're going to have problems, and people need to trust the system. If they don't trust the system, then the system could theoretically fail, and we don't want that. And so, um, oh, and the the big thing I want to mention is down here, the Hemp and Cannabis Research Zone. We are proposing something that's never been done. And so we want to see Florida benefit from hemp and cannabis moving forward to create what we call a Hemp and Cannabis Research Zone or a STAR Zone. The STAR Zone stands, stands for the Space and Treasure Coast Agricultural Research Zone. This zone would go from Brevard County down to St. Lucie County, and it would facilitate all businesses in for hemp and cannabis research, development, product development, um, R&D, Everything involved in that, similar to a Research Triangle Park in Raleigh-Durham or a Silicon Valley in California. We feel that this is going to be the future, especially with hemp. Um, in the next 10 years, we're going to have most single-use plas single plastics will be made of hemp. Most petroleum products will be starting to be phased out and be used with hemp with gasoline, plastics, 
polymers. And so we need a place around the world where people can come and learn about that. And so that's one of our, our uh, big projects that we've been working on for multiple years. Um, see some of our clients we've worked with. Um, UBS, most of you know who they are. Um, I spoke at their global consumer conference earlier this month. And there was a lot of questions from international investors. Um, a lot of people wanted to stay out of the US because it's illegal. So they wanted to focus on companies that focus on the Canadian market. So it was very interesting to be able to, to be in there, that room to talk to those people. Um, this up here in the top right is the Confederated Tribes of the Colville Reservation, which is in Washington State. We consulted with them because they were looking to do a cannabis operation back in 2014, which is like ancient times <laughs> in the cannabis space. And so we were educating them about the rules and laws. For some reason, Indian tribes don't trust the federal government. <laughs> I don't know why. I don't know why. And so uh, they started out, they're, they're did, they did about a 45-acre uh, uh, trial part about uh, uh, two years ago. And so they're starting to move into that hemp production, which now, if you don't know, hemp is 100% legal. It was passed through the 2018 Farm Bill. So you're going to see more hemp, CBD things coming out, uh, which is going to be great. Um, we also worked with Restore Integrative Wellness. This is a dispensary company in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. They uh, applied for a license. We are their corporate compliance directors. And so in, in the state of Pennsylvania, they have uh, 150 stores. Um, and each store, so you have a license there. There's 50 licenses. Each license allows you to have three stores. Well, Restore has six. And so the process of going through the application is very competitive. They actually had about 400 applicants. And they only had, at that time, 26 licenses available. And Restore won two of them. So, which is good. They, they're going to dominate Philadelphia. Uh, and they're going to have six stores all around the metro area. So we work with them. Ironically, one of the owners, he's a physical therapist who worked in the nursing home business. And so he and I were talking because we did a seminar in Philadelphia. And, he, and I remember he came to me. He goes, I know I need you, but I don't know what for yet. So we started talking, and we talked about compliance. He's like, I totally need that because he understood healthcare, And so... What, what I want to relay to people is healthcare is healthcare is healthcare. Your skills that you have here in your industry can translate over to cannabis. And so that's the thing that I get excited about is when I see the light bulbs go off when I talk to people in healthcare, say, this is just like an MDS, it's just like a Mars. You know, it's just like a, the, uh, the a state survey. Yeah, it's the same process. Oh, yeah, oh, okay, okay. So it's not that foreign, and it's very easy to understand. And then... Uh, we spoke to the FBI uh, through the FBI National Academy uh, in June in Orlando last year. We had all the Florida State Troopers, Florida Sheriffs, Chiefs of Police, educating them about the law. The number one thing they said is, we don't really care about cannabis. Our problem's opiates, our problem's crystal meth, our problem's heroin. They literally don't care. He goes, I want, one of the Orlando police officers came up to us afterwards. He said, I've been doing this for 30 years. I've never had a problem with somebody using cannabis. Arresting them, nothing. He goes, alcohol, opiates, heroin, all day long. He goes, people don't rob their mother for marijuana. I say, you're pretty much right. And so we, uh, we started the, also we started the West Virginia Medical Cannabis Society. Um, we will be going into West Virginia. We'll be applying for a license there. We're the only group who actually went into West Virginia to try to help them. And then uh, our partners started the Pennsylvania Medical Cannabis Society. And then the last one, Green Man Cannabis, we actually work to help sell their company. They're out of Denver, Colorado. They have... Um, stores as well as a grow out there so we are working to help sell them um, some of our partnerships that we have um, this company right here integrated compliance solutions if you're an investor write that down they're going public in Canada on the Canadian Securities Exchange probably this summer they write the software that banks use to take marijuana money they're only one of probably two companies in the world right now who do this and it's not sexy it's not glamorous, but every bank who uses cannabis money moving forward is going to have to use either uh, integrated compliance solution or there's another competitor. Um, these guys are from the banking industry, um, and so we partnered with them as well as Parcel. Parcel is a technology company out of Australia. They have a, uh, what they call a seed to sale software program, which most people in the industry understand what seed to sale is. It's just tracking the product from when it goes into the ground all the way to when you sell it at the store. So they developed that, but they've also, and that, that the seed to sale software is gonna be on a blockchain network. If you've heard the word blockchain, I'm not a blockchain expert or crypto expert by any means, 
but basically blockchain is a higher um, secure system in order for people to use computers and it's going to be the future everything's going to move to blockchain it's where it's immutable you can't fake it you can't copy it you can't um, uh, make things that people don't don't see on the other side so it's something to where you can develop trust and cannabis is an industry where we need a lot of trust because there's not a lot of trust out there right now because the rules are, are slowly catching up to the actual industry and so one of the biggest things parcel has done is they've developed the technology for packaging so when you use your iPhone and you go to do Apple pay and you click it that's called near field communication they've developed packaging to where you can put anything in it with this NFC technology to where you can track anything anywhere anytime anywhere in the world and so for cannabis it's perfect because cannabis is, is, a, is an international trade um, product right now it's going to get bigger and bigger as we move forward and we're going to talk about that so we've all partnered together because what we're finding is as countries go legal they don't know what they're doing perfect example the um, st. Vincent's and the Grenadines in the Caribbean they legalized in 2000 December 2018 and so they said hey we're legal so if you come here and give us a million dollars you can grow cannabis okay what are the rules around that oh we don't know that yet how much land will we get? We're going to do 300 acres. Okay, where is it? Oh, we don't know yet. Uh, then, uh, is there a regulatory body? Oh, we haven't set them up yet. So don't worry about it. Just give us your million dollars, and you can come here. And I said, what are the standards of building or any codes? Oh, we'll, we'll get to that later. So literally, these countries are trying to come online because they're seeing the dollar signs, but they don't have the infrastructure set. So if, you, if you're a country and you legalize, you don't have banking, then how's anybody going to invest in your company? How's anybody going to invest in your country? And so that's why we all teamed up to be able to come into countries and help them. Because as this moves forward, you have to have the infrastructure digitally set up in order to allow investment to come into your country. And so this is a big deal. And then Canvas down here, Canvas MD. These guys are data analytics. They're a publicly traded company out of Canada. Um, they do a lot of education for the cannabis space. They also do a lot of data analytics. The same thing that you have for your healthcare business. Who's coming to my facility? Where do they live? Um, how much do they make? You know, what is their common diagnoses? Those types of things, that's what Canvas does. And so they're a leader in the cannabis space so far. All right, the global cannabis market. Last year, 11.5 billion. 95% of that was in North America, 90% in the US. So the, the, there's a nascent market in the global industry. That's going to be changing over the next 10 years. You're going to see a lot more coming out of Europe, which is interesting. Uh, 129 billion by 2029. I think that's low. I think it's going to be a lot higher than that. This picture, if you can't tell, these are all cannabis plants. Just so you know, I just want to let, make sure everybody knew that. Um, the legal cannabis countries right now, the green is medical, the blue is recreational. Okay? There's a lot of gray here. So all this is going to be filled in soon. Right now, there's about 27 countries that's legal that changes almost on a daily basis. We're expecting and projecting 50 by 2020, and we're pretty much on board. About every month, one or two start saying they're going to legalize. Um, most of these countries, as you can tell, 95% is here. These are all nascent markets. But Europe is going to be the market of the future. 700 million people live in Europe. Right now, Germany is the leader. Germany has legalized and they have 80 million people and they're paying for it through socialized medicine. So if you have a payer source, what do people do? They use the product. We all know that with Medicare. So that's why they're going to start growing very, very quickly. And so as you, if you're an investor and you're looking into cannabis companies and they're in Canada, which most of them are, Canada is the beta test. Okay? The globe is where you want to see them investing. Because all these countries who come up, those are going to be the future. Because Right now, everybody's running around, these publicly traders are running around trying to find how many countries they can get into because eventually all the chairs are going to be taken. So all the license is going to be gobbled up. So it's all about your supply in the future. And so they're trying to be able to get that industrial supply ready so when the tsunami of use hits, which is coming, and it keeps growing every day, then they'll be ready for it. Um, this is in the United States. Right here in 2018, we did $10.82 billion. Um, just to give you a, a, an idea about numbers and projections, in 2013, the United States did $1 billion in total revenue in cannabis. It was projected then that in 2018, we would do $6 billion. 
We did 10.82. So take these numbers with a grain of salt as they go up to 24 billion by 2025. I think it's going to be higher. You can, you can basically estimate 30% growth every year in cannabis. And so this doesn't count really the whole CBD market. That's totally separate. This is just cannabis THC products. Um, the federal position, as we all know, it's illegal. Everything's illegal. But uh, so, so anything you deal with, if you're having patients who, uh, who have, are in federal housing projects, they can't have cannabis. They can actually get kicked out. This happened in Massachusetts. It's a huge uh, a, a black eye for the state. And finally, they let the, it was a patient who was using cannabis. They finally let him back in because all the press was so bad. This, this elderly gentleman on disability got kicked out of his, his uh, federal housing because he was using legal cannabis. And they, they finally let him back in. But it's just a mess in that respect. But FBI, DEA, um, all these different groups. One of the things to point out here is a code called IRS 280E. And that's a tax code. This tax code was put in in the 1980s for drug dealers, which states you're not allowed to deduct the cost of the sale of an illegal item. So the dispensaries that are in the state, um, technically, they cannot deduct the cost of the sale of the cannabis. And so that's why typically you go in there to where they have the cannabis sitting in a back room. It's not actually open. Most of the dispensaries, they don't have, they don't have actual products sitting around. You have to go somewhere else and get it. And that's because in that space, they can't deduct any of those costs involved in selling the illegal product. So you're getting cannabis companies that are having, um, out west, they're having tax rates 50, 60, 70, 80 percent. You know, because when this started way back in 2012, states like in Washington, they didn't understand that. And so they were losing tons of money. They would get an IRS audit and say, you owe us $800,000, um, pay it or, or else. And so the government has been slow to get rid of that because it's so much money for them, the federal government. So it's illegal, but we'll still take your tax money. Okay, I always remember, I always still got to pay your taxes. Um, U.S. cannabis marketplace right now, people ask me when we're going to go legal. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when, because we have 93% of people want medical marijuana. The latest study, 63% want recreational. And this is what I talked about taxes, 30 to 70%, depending on the line of business. The patient prevalence, this is important to know, 2 to 4% of any state of the population typically qualifies. Here in the state of Florida, 440, 420 to 840,000 patients. Um, right now, we're sitting around 250,000. Um, we're going up three to 5,000 patients a week, and that's going to increase now that we have flour that's legal, and we'll get into that. Um, also, the recreational, uh, recreational state province, 10 to 12% of the population is using cannabis on a monthly basis in legal states. That's in the United States. Canada, they're projecting over 20%. It's a lot of people, okay? So we have 300 and, what, 330 million people in the U.S.? It's a lot of people. So that's what we're going to see using on a regular basis. This is going to become more and more common, which is good. This is where marijuana is legal currently. The gray or the blue is medical, and the green is recreational. Um, you can see there's nowhere down here, but that's about to change. A lot of places in the south are going to go, when Texas ends up going, it's going to have to go wrecked. I mean, not Rex. We have to go legal in the United States. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. So uh, Texas technically has a program. Um, it's very bad. They only have one qualifying condition, which is intractable seizures for children. And there's three stores in the entire state. Yeah, that's that's that's, a, that's sustainable. I'm I'm kidding. That's not sustainable. So typically, what we see is a lot of politicians try to put in a rule and a law, and it's so strict it doesn't even work. It's basically set up to fail. Um, States working to legalize medical marijuana right now for this year, Kentucky, South Carolina, Tennessee. Georgia's already put in a bill, so I think it's going to pass. Georgia's technically been legal for about four years, and their law states, if you could somehow get the product here and break federal law, we won't arrest you. <laughs> that, that's their law. And they're all sitting there patting each other on the back. Oh, we did such a great job. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. So they have 8,000 people who have this card where they can fly to Colorado and bring it back. But they're breaking federal law, but the state says it's okay. So this year, they're, they're actually going to allow for uh, lights, cultivation licenses, dispensary licenses, we think. We'll see what happens. And so it's slowly breeding into the South, and we expect Texas to expand their program. There's been a lot of talk about that this year. Um, for these pictures, by the way, these right here, if you can't see these, these are espresso beans that have cannabis in them. And so, um, and this is just a vape pen right here. But um, 
You're going to see cannabis when edibles come out, hopefully later this year in the state of Florida. They've been legal, but the state of uh, Department of Health has been dragging their feet on getting regulations. You're going to see a lot of different types of products like that. Um, these are the states working to do recreational, uh, most in the Northeast. Um, New York is talking about it. We think they may pass. New Jersey just announced yesterday they probably don't have the votes to get recreational this year. It's coming, though. So we expect by 2020. Uh, Maryland, Delaware, they're all going. Florida, maybe. You know, there's the, the challenge with Florida is to do another constitutional amendment unless John Morgan gets behind it. You have to get a million, million signatures. And right now they have about 60,000. So I don't know if they're going to get enough by then. If it doesn't go in 2020, uh, it's definitely going to happen. It's just a matter of time in that respect. Um, also down here, just to kind of put this up, this is, this is black tea, and it has THC in it. So you can take a lot of different types of things. When edibles come out, when edibles or products come out, you'll have things like that. So imagine uh, your, your K-Pod for your coffee, they'll have it in there, they'll have it in tea, they'll have it in all these different ways where you can take your medicine in a very subtle and relaxing way. And then this is uh, cannabis right here. It's being um, dried out. And so that way it is hung like that so it can dry because you don't want it too wet if you're going to use it for flour, which is when you actually smoke it. A lot of times if you're going to use this for oil, sometimes they don't dry it. and They just put it right in the, what I call a hopper. Not the technical term, but uh, I'll show you that a picture in a little bit on how that looks. Um, the Florida industry right now, 250 million last year, projected to be 1.6 billion next year. Pretty big jump. So what's happening is everything's getting ready, meaning all the stores are now open. You notice the, the societal ideology is starting to decline. The numbers start going up. We're primed to just go crazy in growth, and that's what we're starting to see. USF and Forbes have both predicted that. Uh, the growth rate's 140 percent. It's going gonna, it's gonna to keep going up. It's going to keep going up here because what I find is, especially seniors and people who are on a lot of prescriptions, they're tired of it. They're tired of the copays. They're tired of the side effects. Once people get on cannabis, they typically decrease the amount of prescriptions, two to three prescriptions a month, and we see that continuing. We're seeing people uh, now, the research is showing they can actually control blood sugar for diabetes is actually helping with, um, with anxiety. A lot of those anxiety meds, antipsychotic meds, those types of things is definitely helping getting people off of those, which is good. Um, one of the big things that, that I, I talk about is the three pillars of this business, which is public safety, patient or consumer access, and commerce. These things have to balance for a system to work. If they're out of balance and the system doesn't work, we'll get into that. I wrote an article for Orlando Medical News about this last September in 2018. So if you ever get Orlando Medical News, I'm the cannabis contributing writer, so if you hate my articles, email me, tell me. Um, it's fine. But I try to educate the medical staff in the area about this is what's happening and this is why, and so to kind of follow what's going on. So with the three pillars, public safety, the enforcement of the laws, how easy is it to get a license to produce, um, how, what is the, the punitive measure on uh, if you have it with you and you don't have your card, can you get arrested? Um, how easy is it for the, uh, the, the dispensaries to open up stores with the zoning, things like that? Then the patient access, how easy is it for a doctor to write a, a recommendation, not a prescription? You can't, do a, you can't prescribe a drug that's illegal. So um, it has to be here in Florida, it's called a certification. And then commerce, can the stores make money? They have to make money. If they don't, then everybody goes to the black market. And the whole point of having a legal system is to create a, a regulatory structure and a tax system to be able to get that revenue to be able to do it right. So an unbalanced system, everybody knows California. In their defense, they were the first in 1996. They switched over to recreational, and it's kind of been a mess. Um, but before that, under medical, they didn't have a lot of rules. So the main rule was the, the municipalities would uh, regulate whether you could be in that location or not, but they had no lab testing rules. They had no uh, rules on how to grow the product. They had no rules on contaminants on the product. And so it was just a mess. Um, also, there was really no um, qualifying conditions. Oh, I got a hangnail. OK, here you go, 60 bucks. Here's a license, um, a, a prescription. You can get it. And so there was a patient who actually died in California, uh, not from cannabis, but the contaminants on the cannabis ended up leading him to die. He was a cancer patient. And there was heavy lead and heavy metals that were the cannabis was, was sprayed on or what have you. And he died from those heavy metals because they didn't have lab testing. 
Um, in the state of Florida, we technically, technically have lab testing, but the rules have not been implemented yet. But a lot of the companies, uh, True Leave, I know, is doing it. Um, I'm not sure if Grow Healthy or Vitacan are ours. I don't know if you guys are doing it yet. Okay, she's saying yes, they're doing Vitacan. They're, they're doing it. So most companies are doing lab testing. I actually know one of the largest labs uh, here in Florida, and I know they come from a medical background, and they're doing the lab testing correctly. And that's what we need. We need to, be, we need to build trust into this system. And then New York was the exact opposite. The public safety was way too strict when they started. Um, they, their license was, at, and when they started, they had five licenses in the whole state. It was a vertically integrated license, which means you have to grow the product, you have to process it, and you have to sell it all by yourself. And you could only open four stores per license. Well, if there's five licenses and four stores per license, that's 20 stores for 20 million people. That doesn't make a lot of sense. And so they've had to go back five times and change the system. So now they have 10 licenses, they have up to 40 stores, uh, nurse practitioners and physician's assistants can actually write recommendations rather than doctors. They're starting to come up, but to give you an idea, New York is sitting around 75,000 patients. They were, they've been up and operational a year longer than Florida, and we're at about 250,000 patients. So it's a lot easier here to be able to get a, license, get a, a prescription, a recommendation. Um, state regulations is important to know. I hear this all the time. Well, my buddy was in Colorado, and he just opened a license and made a million dollars. I'll just come down here in Florida and do that same thing. It doesn't work that way. Every state's like a different country. Every state has gone out and said, we're going to do it our way because we know best. And so you get these states to where they're all, they're all different. Some are stricter, some are more loose, and we'll get into those uh, differences here in just a minute. The state and local zoning play a huge role. For example, in California, the local, um, local cities are able to figure out if you're going to be there or not. They approve. Um, Massachusetts, is they just went recreational, and they say they have unlimited licenses for recreational, but the local municipality must approve how many stores go in each city. So that's how they're regulating it. Where in Florida, right now, if you want to do a growing operation, a store, excuse me, a, a cultivation location, the only requirement is you have to be 500 feet away from a school. If you want to do a dispensary, the cities can do one of two things. They can ban them outright, or if they allow them, they cannot limit the number of stores, and they, they have to maintain the same zoning as a pharmacy. Because what we were seeing, in, for example, in Massachusetts when they started, you were having excuse me, municipalities were coming out and saying, okay, you can come here, but you've got to pay us $200,000, and you've got to give us 5% of your company. That's fair. You know, I'm sure they do that for everybody, don't they? So to me, you know, you got the other side, the government saying, okay, if we're going to allow this, we're going to maximize our profits. Well, what does that do? That just hikes up the price. So there has to be that good balance. And so the governing body determines the direction, the regulation of, of the program. Here's the Department of Health. In the state of Washington, it's the Liquor Control Board. In the state of Cal uh, excuse me, Colorado, it's the Department of Revenue. They oversee gaming. So um, it just depends on the state and how they, they regulate it. So here, if you're in healthcare, it's, it's good to know that the Department of Health is overseeing this. So they take more of a health approach which is good, and that's what people in healthcare would want. You know, that's what I want, so they understand where we're going. And also, the more licenses available, the cheaper the entry point. So, in Oklahoma right now, Oklahoma passed a constitutional amendment to legalize in June of last year. There was no limit on the number of licenses, and the application fee was $3,500, non-refundable, and you had to pass a background check. That's it. Now, today, they have 65,000 patients who've signed up by the way, there's no medical qualifying condition. So that you can just go into a doctor and say, I have a hangnail, give me a license, give me a prescription. He'll do it. Um, there's 3,500 licensed businesses already in the state of Oklahoma. And to put that in perspective, there's 14 here. So if you have 3,500 licensed businesses, and most of those have never run a business, are they going to be successful? Right. Are you going to have problems when they can't sell their product? What are they going to do? You think they're going to be like, oh, okay, I didn't sell my product. I'm going to go home now. No. They're going to start selling it out the back door. That's when you have a public safety problem. And so that's where we try to educate legislatures to say, you can't have it all one way and you can't have it all the other way. It has to be balanced because that's what protects society. And so a lot of people don't see the big picture. We try to bring that into the big picture. A um, little bit about West Coast and East Coast. On the West Coast of the U.S., Typically less regulation, 
um, less cost to start it up, as I mentioned in Oklahoma. Um, usually more of an adult use focus, and so most of the states are going recreational out there. Um, and most of the times, they can do outdoor and indoor grows out there. And so here on the East Coast, a lot different, more medically focused, um, typically higher startup cost, less licenses. Um, all the growing on the East Coast has to be indoors. Now with hemp, you're going to hear hemp is being grown outdoors. If you don't know the, don't know the difference, hemp, by definition, has less than 0.03% THC. So THC is the stuff that technically gets you high. Hemp is an industrial product. It's used to make all things from plastics to food to clothing to paper. And so that's what farmers are going to start growing here, hopefully, later this year. Um, but that grows outdoors. So if you, you start going by fields later this year, and you're like, that looks like marijuana. And it probably smells like it, too. It's not. It's hemp, because it has to be tested. So it won't get you high. There's been cases where kids have gone out and stole it all, and stole like some, and tried to smoke it. You can smoke hundreds and hundreds of pounds. It's not going to do anything at all in that respect. Um, some of the choke points in a national or state or system, the, the physician recommendations. Um, if, if the practice is too tight, then not enough people can, can actually uh, get approved for the medication. Perfect example here in Florida. When they started, they had a 30-day time period where you had to go back to your doctor every 30 days to renew your prescription. But if I had an opiate prescription, I can wait six months or maybe even a year and keep getting my opiates. How does that make sense? So through the, the different legislatures and through 2016 and, and 2017, the law, they changed it. Now it's every uh, seven months, which is good. So it makes it more realistic. By the way, the average fee for a doctor here in the state of Florida for a marijuana recommendation is between $150 and $300, to give you an idea. You go once every seven months. The average cost per medication right now is somewhere between $200, maybe $150 and $300 a month, depending on what you get. So to give you an idea, if your mother or your father or somebody's looking at the medication, that's typically what you're going to pay. The biggest thing I hear about cannabis in Florida is they like it, except they don't want to pay for it. Well, I don't want to pay for gasoline either, but you know we all have to pay for different things right now. And the patient ID cards, that was a, a big problem. Also, one thing back on the doctors, uh, what we find is the doctors who typically write recommendations, they don't work for Advent Health or big companies, because most of those doctors now are employees. Their employer says you can't do this, so they don't do it. So what we typically see is independent doctors who write recommendations, um, walk-in clinic doctors, those types of guys uh, and, and gals. And so uh, that's what we typically see um, on a national level. But the ID cards here in the state of Florida, it was taking up to 90 days to get an ID card. Um, it was just horrible. Now they've got it dialed in, so it's about 10 to, 10 to 20 days, depending on when you get your money in, that type of thing. So it's a lot quicker. Okay. Tax structure is a big issue that we talked about. Um, one of the things that the California did under recreational, they allowed the, the municipalities to tax at their own rate. So if you're in LA County, you go in and buy a, a, an ounce of cannabis, you're paying 50% tax. That's why people buy it on the black market. Do you want to sit there and pay 50% tax on a product where you can go to your buddy down the street and not pay any tax? So you have to know if we want to get rid of the black market, we can't tax it too high. We recommend the total tax be less than 20% because you're going to sell more. People are going to come into the system and do it legally rather than staying and their buddy in the black market and getting something that they don't know what it is. Uh, banking is always a big issue, as we talked about before. There was a Safe Banking Act that came up yesterday of uh, the House. I didn't see if they voted on it, but eventually banking will come in. Technically, it's illegal, but there's about 400 banks in the U.S. who do, do banking. As long as you follow FinCEN guidelines from 2014, um, you can actually take this money. And so we're, we're trying to work with banks and compliance companies to get more banking into the system because if we get more banking into the system, we make it safer. And that's the big thing. We've got to make sure this is safe. Luckily in Florida, we have not had any issues with crime in any of the dispensaries or the medical marijuana treatment centers, so which is good. Um, in Oklahoma, as I mentioned before, they've been up and operational less than eight or nine months. They already have break-ins. They already have robberies because the system's not set up right. And so those are the things. And then regulations, as we talked about, too strict. Um, in the Florida, the, what got us started after 2016 was uh, Senate Bill 3, uh, 8A, which is now uh, Statute 381.986. And this became effective in July of 2017. It sets the system that we have up now. Um, how many licenses are given, the procedures for physicians, uh, the residency requirements, 
right now there is a there is a caveat in for snowbirds if they want to get uh, medical marijuana. It's kind of hard. Um, it's kind of difficult, and so I'm expecting that to be a little bit easier. Usually, there's something called reciprocity. If you qualify in one state, you can qualify here, but in Florida, you have to qualify based on Florida law, not on another another state, and so that makes it a little bit more difficult for people. Um, it also establishes qualifications to become a caregiver. You can have up to, uh, well, a caregiver can have up to two clients, or, or excuse me, let me reverse that. If I'm a patient, I can have up to two caregivers. And the theory is, okay, if my sister's one and she's out of town, I have somebody else. Some states, they will allow you to have unlimited caregivers. The problem with that is I could be one person and I could be a caregiver for 80 people and I could be growing myself and actually be dispensing and there's no rules and laws and I don't like that system because you can get a lot of fraud that way. So say if I grow 100 pounds in a year and each of my patients only needs half of that, what am I doing with the rest? Can't smoke it all, it's too much. So I'm probably selling it illegally. And so those are the things that we see. Um, and then the requirements, the standards for the MMTC. The MMTC is called a Medical Marijuana Treatment Center. That's what the licensees here, the True Leaves, the Vitacans, the Cure Leaves, all those, that's what they're called. Um, this cause requires laboratory testing, as I mentioned before. They're still going through the process of reviewing those laws. It's only been two years. We can't rush it, right? We're going to take our time on this, and that's what frustrates me. If it was another industry, they would have these, the, these uh, pumped out immediately, but they've just been dragging their feet, which is frustrating. And then they did collect the, create the Coalition for Medical Cannabis Research. It's done through the Moffitt Center in Tampa, but they didn't fund it. They gave them about 500000 to get started, but as of now, there hasn't been any research that's been done there yet. Um, these are the qualifying conditions in Florida. And so um, I'll read them to you briefly if you can't see them all. Cancer, epilepsy, glaucoma, HIV, AIDS, PTSD, ALS, Crohn's, Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis. And then these two at the bottom are very critical. Medical conditions of the same kind or class as are comparable to these above. And then the bottom says chronic non-malignant pain caused by a qualifying medical condition, blah, 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 blah. The most common diagnosis in Florida is chronic pain. Right now, number two, usually is PTSD. So also, the medical condition is the same kind or class. If I have uh, cancer, well, that's a bad example. If I have Parkinson's disease, or, or maybe I had a stroke. Well, Parkinson's disease and strokes are kind of similar. You have the same type of diagnoses, same type of symptoms. So you could qualify because it's a, it's a similar condition. Um, if I have, uh, to me, uh, uh, another chronic pain is, is in there. It could be any type of chronic pain. And it's up to the doctor to determine how to write that in to get a recommendation. This is uh, the OMU website. This is an update they do every Friday. This is from March 15th, and I don't expect you to read this. It's kind of small, but I want to point out some things. It says total patients, 250,000. That's as of March 15th of this year. Then it says qualified patients, 194,000. The way the Department of Health delineates is if you, if you can be in the system, but unless you have an ID card, you're not a real patient. So we're at we, we've just passed 200,000, but there's 194,000 people with ID cards. So that's mean they went through the whole system. They got, it looks like a driver's license, and they have that card. Then down here, it says qualified ordering physicians. There's 2,106, which is good. And then it's showing the processing time for ID cards is five business days. As I mentioned before, it was up to 90 days. So the state's getting better in that respect. And then these are the providers right now. 14 providers, see True Leaves at the top because they have the most stores. Um, they have 100, as of a couple weeks ago, there's 108 stores that are open. So the stores are going up about two to three a week. So in, by the end of the year, we should kind of have a couple hundred open, which is good. More access usually means the price is going to start coming down, more competition, which is good. And then um, the stores right now can open up to, it's about 30 dispensaries until next year after, after April 2020, 420, you might get it, it's a joke. <laughs> uh, after 420, they can open as many as they want. True Leave actually went to court to try to get this uh, overturned because they want to ramp up. They want to open as many stores as possible to beat everybody to market, but they were shot down through a, a lawsuit, so they're going to have to wait another year, but you're going to see True Leave probably open 20 stores next year. Right now, they're almost at their cap. I think they're at 27, and then stores like Cure Leaf and Sutera, they're, they're close. All the people down here, they're just getting started. To give you an idea on value, 
Um, there was a license that sold uh, in January. It's a company called Acreage Holdings. They are down here at the very bottom. They bought a license, no cultivation, no seeds in the ground, piece of paper, $67 million. Vitacan, back there, they just sold to, Kronos, uh, to Cresco Labs for $120 million. And the difference is Vitacan has stores open. They have revenue. The closer you get to revenue and producing revenue, the higher your value. Simple mathematics. And a lot of, a lot of uh, and, and what we're seeing is publicly traded are coming into Florida. Right now we have eight or nine. And to give you an, uh, an, um, uh, a comparison, California has maybe one. And the reason we have so many publicly traded here is because we have a good system. Limited number of licenses, a lot of opportunity to, to be able to make money, and limited competition. So typically the publicly traded, they like to come into highly regulated states, which are typically in the East Coast. Um, however, Nevada, New Mexico, Arizona, those are really good states. So if, as an investor, if they're investing in those states, um, there's a rhyme and reason why they buy licenses in certain states. Um, this gentleman, Tom Brokaw, most of you know who he is. He's a medical marijuana patient in Florida. He was just diagnosed with blood cancer. So it was a whole article. This was yesterday. He was talking about how he's using medical marijuana. He lives down in southwest Florida, um, and he said it's really helping him. So he's 79. What we see is seniors are getting on board. They're realizing, you know what? I'm tired of taking these meds. It's going to make me feel better, help me eat. So I thought this is good. He just came out, so you'll probably hear a little bit more about that. A physician certification, um, how does it work? Is there actually a real certification? You have to go into a little doctor. You have to do a face-to-face -face visit. Um, they have to put it in, your, in the recommendation into the computer program, which is, goes to the Department of Health. Um, it's, a real license, it's a real certification. It's not like California where you go in and he doesn't even look at you and just pumps it out. They have to physically see them. There's no telemedicine. Can't do any telemedicine with cannabis. A lot of other things you can, but you can in cannabis. Uh, the type of delivery methods. Um, we see a lot of this, a lot of vapor. We see a lot of vape pens. Flower is, flower is the actual bud. It's the actual marijuana plant. That just became legal. We'll talk about that in a little bit. You're going to see a lot more use of your patients who are using flour. Um, and they're going to be having it laying around their house when you come in and you talk to them if you're home health care or you're a, a doctor's office. By the way, 40% of patients who have a medical marijuana recommendation don't tell their internal medicine doc or their primary care physician. 40%. Why? They don't feel comfortable. That's what we have to change. Because what we see and what I see specifically is this is a huge cost savings because, one, if I'm the insurance company, I don't have to pay for it. If I'm the doctor, I'm working in an ACO, then if it can lower my cost for that patient who has diabetes, he can, he can take cannabis, and his blood sugar is going to be in line. He doesn't have to take any medications. Remember, ACOs got to pay for all that. So if they don't have to pay for that anymore, they're going to save money. And if you can do that hundreds of thousands of times, it's a lot of money. And that's what a lot of people don't want to get on board. The data analysts with cannabis are going to be critical to be able to save money specifically in Florida because <clears throat> everybody, the first person who jumps on this, the first company, is going to see the cost savings and everybody else is going to have to get in line. So I see software programs for this. I see companies specializing in this. In my, in my form of business, nursing homes, if a nursing home says, we'll allow you to take your medication in these facilities, they're going to be full. Because in the future, when you're a golfer and you're 78 years old, you've got to go in for a hip replacement and you're used to taking cannabis for pain, and you go into the rehab for three weeks and you can't have it and they put you back on opiates, you're not going to be happy. And so we're finding people who are seeking out nursing homes and rehab centers they can go into who allow them to take cannabis. So the nursing homes are scared and rehab and home health are scared because they're federally funded. Well, this is illegal federally. So they're worried they're going to lose their Medicare certification, which to me is a lot of BS because I've been in that industry. There's a way to do it. You can self-medicate. It's in the state law. You can do that. So there's ways around it, but a lot of people, a lot of companies are just a little bit nervous. Um, the update for this year, so far Senate Bill 182 was just passed a couple weeks ago. They allow for flour. This is flour. Some people call it bud. Um, the maximum you can have is four ounces, and you can buy two and a half ounces every 35 days. So you go in and buy if you want to get a certain strain or whatever you like. Typically, with our market, I don't see this as much. I see them more. My concern with flour is dosing. How do you know if you get a super lemon haze or a blue dream and how it's going to react and how many times you take it? To me, you know, some people benefit from it. And I'm okay with that. But I'd rather see a topical. I'd rather see an oil base where I can tell a patient, hey, 
you do three drops every two hours, every six hours, whatever the case may be. What we talk about a lot is assimilation into the current structure. If I'm 82 and I'm used to taking pills all day long, am I going to be comfortable smoking that? Probably not. You give me another pill or a small little piece of chocolate, I've got to take that twice a day, I may do that. You know? So we have to make sure to, to understand from a senior market what's going to be the best form that they're used to and what, what they're most comfortable in taking. Um, they can purchase paraphernalia anywhere now. Believe it or not, it was actually illegal to purchase bongs and things like that. Everybody still had them. That was under Rick Scott, but now they had to get rid of that. Um, you can't smoke in public, which is smart. And under 18, you have to get another, um, uh, you have to get, actually get a pediatrician to approve it. So this has been hot. You're going to see a lot of this coming up. You're going to have patients who are coming in who smell like weed. Get used to it. It's going to happen. If you're in home health care, you're going to go to a patient's house who have cannabis sitting out on the table and it's going to smell like cannabis. You don't need to call police anymore. <laughs> okay? This is their medicine. We have to get used to that. Um, also, the uh, cannabis stores, they have to sell at least one type of pre-rolled cigarette. This is a, over here. Pre the, just, you know, they don't call joints, they don't call them joints anymore, they're called pre-rolls. Okay? That's the new terminology, just so you know. Um, and so they're going to put in lab testing rules later this year. The doctors must authorize the smoking of cannabis. And so now what you're seeing on the blogs is um, all the patients are upset because they're going back to their doctor to add it on. Some of the doctors are charging $150 just to add on smoking. So now come, some of the big companies are coming out and say they're just going to charge a flat fee of $25, $50 to be able to add that on. Um, then lab testing it was coming in. Edible rules should be coming out this summer. And remember, edibles is, is uh, anything that's going to be ingested. So cookies, cakes, things like that. Um, I'm hoping they come out with more unit dose products for seniors rather than... Um, just, uh, just basic uh, things they're not used to, like a whole cookie or things like that. When they do come out with that, they're going to come out with dosing. Typically, the national dosing right now for edibles is 10 milligrams. So if you go to Colorado or California, one cookie should be 10 milligrams no matter where you go. It makes sense because they, when it first came out in 2012, they would have a cookie, and it would be 1,000 milligrams. Okay? If you don't know 1,000 milligrams, <laughs> you wouldn't be, I wouldn't be standing here with 1,000 milligrams. It'll totally wipe you out. So 10 milligrams is, 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 if I can compare it to alcohol, which I don't like to, but 10 milligrams is like one or two beers. And so it kind of gets to the point where people can handle that. So th there was no standardization. So people were freaking out and going to the hospital and all these different things because they had too much. Uh, the, you would go to the stores and the bud tenders, those are the people, the sales associates, would sit there and say, cut it into sixteenths. You could have this, this cookie. It's like, that doesn't make a lot of sense. So now they're getting the standard dosing, so anything that you take would be typically 10 milligrams. Um, and they're, going to, they're expecting to uh, add more licenses um, this summer or fall. This has been um, two years in the making. They were supposed to add more licenses back in October 2017. Currently, there's 14 license holders. So more competition, lower the cost. Um, this has been fought in litigation now for two years. The state only actually issued five licenses for an application process. The rest were awarded through litigation. Because the state was so bad in dealing the system and the way it was set up, they were sued seven or eight times and lost every single time because the system was not fair, I guess you'd say. Um, and so now the, the law states that for every 100,000 patients uh, that the state adds, you have to add one, uh, excuse me, four new license, licensees. Um, when it hit 100,000, they didn't add any. We just hit 200,000, they haven't added any. So this has been in litigation. We're hoping this will all get resolved through the legislative session this year. And you should be able to hear more companies who will be getting awarded licenses um, later this year. Case in point, you're going to have to, okay, you're going to have to, um, it'll take about uh, a year for a new license to get up and running. So even if you hear new licensees coming on, it'll take about a year to get up and running. Types of products. This is flour, okay. This is a vape pen. You've all seen that. These are edibles. Will they look like this? I don't know. These are cookies, lollipops, things like that. This over here is an extraction machine. When you make an oil, the way you do it is you put the actual plant material here, and you go all through this system, and it comes out here and is oil. So these machines can run anywhere between 400,000 and 850,000 each. And this is a small machine. So the, the uh, new machines can, can produce um, probably I don't know, eight or nine liters a day. I mean, a lot of oil. That's a lot of oil. So 
Um, these are the machines where it has to be extracted, which they use. Uh, the future, a lot more consolidation, as I just told you. Vitacans are going to sell for $120 million. We're going to see more consolidation, uh, more competition. And then the market's going to be 80% wellness and what I call the 20% stoner market when we go wreck, which is going to happen. Wellness is, think, nutritional supplements. I'm going to take a little bit every day, and I'm going to get, I'm going to feel better. And because cannabis has what they call an endocannabinoid system, or excuse me, our bodies do, and cannabis has cannabinoids. So it's a lock and key system for our body. That's why there's no rejection. And that way, that's why nobody has ever died from it in human history. Another interesting fact, the reason cannabis stays in your system so long, up to 30 to 45 days, is because your body uses it. Whereas cocaine, meth, alcohol gets rid of it because it's more of a poison in that respect. Data analytics are going to be huge. And for, for here, everybody here, healthcare education, awareness, and acceptance. If you're willing to accept cannabis as a medication, your patients already are. I told you 40% of patients who are currently active don't tell their doctors. So if you can be that healthcare group that is, accepts this, you're going to get more people. And then home delivery, of course, is going to get even better. And I'll leave you with this from a technological aspect. This is a, a grow in Colorado in about 2010. And you notice low ceilings, lights are, are right on top of the plants. The plants are very, very large. And this is a publicly traded grow in Canada. There's an open roof to be able to get sunlight to decrease cost. And the amount of plants per square foot has dramatically increased. So all these are going through data analytics. They're going through technology to where they can produce more cannabis for a cheaper price. And now I'll open it up for questions. And please wait to uh, get the microphone to you. I have, um, represent a physician's office that is currently um, qualifying patients or certifying patients. And with the recent change in the smokables, um, we're, it seems like even though it's been approved, they're continuing to put up uh, barricades, making it difficult for the change. When we qualified the patients initially, if they're like and kind, um, we had to research and find documentation, which we did. And now with smokables, now we have to find documentation again specific to smokables. Do you anticipate that whenever any of these changes go along, um, <clears throat> when we change to edibles, are we going to have to, to prove um, edibles are, are good for our patients for their particular diagnosis? That's, that's one, the first question. The other okay. question is, is a hemp question. Um, there's been popping up in media reports that in South Florida there have been police raids on businesses that are selling hemp products and they claim that they're total legal hemp products but they're be their merchandise is being confiscated and has that kind of gone away because it's, it's a little disconcerting for a practice that wants to provide hemp hemp products to our patients who want to take it slowly in the medical marijuana? So let me address the hemp question first. That's been going on nationally. It's happened in Tennessee. It was so bad. The, the police actually had a press conference after they raided the store, and they have the podium, and all the, the press agents were there, and they're saying that this is totally illegal, and it's, it's marijuana. And literally, all the reporters are like, no, it's only CBD. And the, the, the sheriff actually literally said, well, what is CBD? Yes, this is what we're dealing with. This is, this is it. And so these raids, there was one in Melbourne at a flea market. Uh, they were selling CBD. We see this sparing uh, around. Um, and the challenge is there was actually a, a, a shipment of hemp. It was a tractor trailer that went from, uh, I think, um, Texas to Iowa or something, and it was stopped in Oklahoma. And all the, the drivers were arrested, and they said, and, and the policemen were like, we're, you're going to go to jail for hundreds of years or whatever. Once they tested it and realized it was hemp, they let them go. So the challenge is, what we're seeing is the federal government legalized hemp in 2018 in December. Okay? So the USDA is in charge of actually setting up the hemp program. Well, they came out and said, we're not going to have the rules out until probably September, October. And then the FDA is actually in charge of CBD and implementing rules. Um, and Gottlieb, who's the FDA commissioner who's now re retiring, he came out a couple weeks ago in front of Congress and he said, we're not going to have this probably for two years. But what they're thinking is, there's going to, they're thinking they're going to, first of all, he said that we've never done this before, so you know, take, take what we do with a grain of salt. We're kind of figuring it out as we go. 
but he said what they're thinking is if it's over a certain uh, concentration of CBD, it'll be pharmaceutical grade. You got to go through the FDA. But if it's under a certain amount, it'll be more food grade. So I see that changing. In regards to adding on new requirements for edibles, I don't think so because edibles are actually a better dosing strategy. I think they're going to be more education because if you're not aware, edibles hit, uh, react differently in the body than smoking. It could take up to two to three hours to have an effect. So when you hear about these people going to the hospital, it's because they're impatient. <laughs> they take one or two, nothing happens. They take five more, and then it all hits them at once. And then they have a not enjoyable experience. And so the thing you want with cannabis is you want to have an enjoyable experience as a medicine. Most people who are seniors, they don't want to get high. People who have chronic pain don't get high with cannabis typically. They just feel better and can function. So I think it's, go it's going to happen more education. What I haven't seen is any physician groups who sell CBD, because a lot of them do, haven't seen any problems with those because it's a professional way. And if I'm a, 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 a policeman coming in, I'm going to have to go to my superiors and say, we're going to bust Dr. Tim Green because he's selling CBD and he's been a practicing physician for 35 years with no problems. They're going to think twice before hitting a guy in a flea market who's selling CBD, who's not as professional, who has tattoos and a beard and fits the profile. And let me tell you, there's a lot of profiling in this industry right now. So, so that's definitely going to, hopefully that'll weed itself out over time. <laughs> no pun intended, of yes. course. <laughs> Next question. Hi. Is this thing on? Yeah. <laughs> um, my name is Tish Middleton. I'm actually the territory manager for Vitacan here in Orlando. Um, we are partnering with an Israeli company called Tikkun Alam, and they are the largest medical cannabis company in Israel, and they have a ton of clinical research behind their strains. We're very excited to bring products to patients that have clinical research behind them. So my question is, in the American Journal of Medical Cannabis, you mentioned you're going to be providing clinical research from other countries. Since we're still, unfortunately, stuck on the Schedule 1 here, and we have very limited data, I mean, except out of maybe Ole Miss, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so are you going to be printing a lot of data from trials in Israel? From everywhere, and what we're going to try to focus on is studies that meet the FDA criteria. Because the challenge now is, if I'm talking to a physician, and they're reading this magazine, and by the way, a lot of physicians, the, the magazine is going to be taken off of, uh, it's going to be kind of mirror the New England Journal of Medicine. The challenge is a lot of physicians don't read doing New England Journal of Medicine because it's kind of boring. I mean, I hate to say it, the younger physicians don't really read it. They may take a study or two. But our goal is to be able to try to get the, the tr studies that, that fit the FDA criteria. That way, when doctors look at this, some in Florida, but primarily we're trying to educate doctors nationwide because as this moves forward throughout the South and other states, then they have something, something tangible to hold on to. So when their med medical board or somebody comes and kind of threaten them and say, you're going to lose your license, they can back up that research. So we're going to try to stay with more FDA-focused studies. They won't be technically FDA-focused studies, but be similar. And Dr. Jahan Macau, he'll be in charge as the editor-in-chief. He'll be in charge of those studies. You know, from my end, I'm going to be more the regulatory and technological side to educate doctors on how this should be taken in an edible form or vapor or something like that. Um, but yeah, that's what we're going to, we're going to stay in that, that area. We have another question here. Hi, my name's Brittany. Um, so this is a personal question, but also a question that I've heard from other patients as well. Um, so from a pain management um, perspective, as, as cannabis is legal, but then also as it becomes recreational, what I've heard from physicians is that, no, you can't take it because my license is national. So, because you have to be drug tested when you go. And so if cannabis is legal here, how does that affect the patients? Because patients will go to their will go to our physicians and they'll say, "Nope, if it shows up on your drug test, you can't take it." And you know, and we'll say, "But it's legal here. You know, can I if I go get the, you know, this is what I want to do." And you know, what about when it becomes legal, you know, recreationally? You know, because we're trying to figure out other ways to take care of ourselves mm -hmm. and. Um, you know, and it's hard when you found a good physician and, you, you know, you've done all these things and then, it, well, no, because my license is national, so you can't do it. You and mean it, the physician license is national? Yeah, the, okay. and that's kind of thrown back at you as a patient, and so you're fearful. So they're like, well, my license is national. And, and usually so. what we see is, is you still have that. A lot of times it's, it's personal physician preference. Um, what I find is, you all can correct me if I'm wrong, but I've been dealing with doctors now for over 25 years. They're not the most... Um, they're very conservative. 
put it that way. And so they don't want to take chances. They've been to school and spent hundreds of thousands of dollars for their medical license. They don't want to risk it. Um, there's never been, knock on wood, there's never been a doctor who prescribed medical cannabis who lost his license um, outside of Massachusetts. Massachusetts, there were two doctors that uh, they lost their license temporarily. They had to go to court to fight the state because the state said, you're providing too many prescriptions, recommendations. Well, they said it was too many. Well, they had no basis on saying that it was too many because the challenge was at that time, there was 20 doctors who were writing 70% of the recommendations in that state because no doctor would sign up. So two doctors who lost their license took them to court at their own expense, and they won, and they were to get their licenses back. But that was in the early days. What we find is doctors who sit with the rules and they work through the, the set uh, regulations in the state of Florida haven't had any problems so far. So I don't, I don't expect them as long as they're not doing things anything uh, immoral. We had have a couple doctors who've been cited by the Department of Health because they were doing things illegally. Uh, maybe they were selling things they weren't supposed to sell. But if they follow the rules, then the doctors in the state haven't had any problems. But we see that per state. You, you see it a lot where a, a patient comes down from Michigan and say, hey, I'm, I'm a Michigan mar marijuana patient. Or I'm in Canada where it's totally legal, and they still won't allow them to have it. Also, as, as, as employers, um, the state does not protect employer, employees. If you're a medical marijuana patient, you can still be fired. There's a lot of patients that will come and say, hey, I'm applying for this job, and I'm a medical marijuana patient. And a lot of times they'll say, well, we can't hire you because you're not going to pass a drug test. So that was specifically put in the law to protect employers and not employees. Thank you. Hi. It's estimated 560,000 people in the state of Florida have Alzheimer's disease. And since cannabis has been proven to reduce amyloid beta accumulation in the nerve cells, do you have any com comments on initiatives um, to, to advocate the use of cannabis in treating pe people with Alzheimer's disease? I'm very, very bullish on it. I actually, as a therapist, I worked in an all Alzheimer's facility for three years in Boynton Beach. It's the worst disease ever. When you have a spouse who doesn't know who their, sp who their, their wife or their husband is after being together for 65 years, it's just terrible. Um, what we're trying to find is, is, is just educate. Because typically, as, as uh, the, the endocannabinoid receptors, there's more THC receptors in the brain. And believe it or not, THC is, is, helps with pain and it also helps with Alzheimer's to break up the plaques. Um, that's why it works very well for Alzheimer's and cognitive problems. Um, and it works, uh, there's a lot of CBD receptors in the gut, and that's why it works very well for colitis, endometriosis, irritable bowel syndrome, things like that in the gut. So we try to just bring an awareness, and a lot of that is doctor specific. Um, the challenge with Alzheimer's is getting it into the patient. And so that's why we like the oil based medications, because if they're feeding them, drop a couple drops, they don't even know they're taking it. And so what I'd love to see is actually facilities doing that. The challenge is they can't dose the patients because they can't use the medicine because it's federally illegal. So the only way they can do that is if the caregiver, i.e. the spouse, children, whatever, come in every single time they need that medication and give it, to, give it to them, that's the only way they can have it right now, unless they're at home and then they can do it that way. So the delivery system that we have due to law is a challenge for Alzheimer's patients, and I'm hoping that can change. But uh, I've talked to the Florida Healthcare Association. They're not interested in hearing anything about this. It drives me crazy. Um, the Florida Assisted Living Association, they don't want to touch it. I actually met with the state, the highest regulator in the state of Florida through ACA, Agency for Healthcare Administration, last summer. I said, what are you guys doing about medical marijuana in, this, in the facilities? <laughs> she said, CMS has not said one word about it. So literally, it's like a don't ask, don't tell. We're just not going to deal with it. So we're trying to push that. And you can imagine, we're not the good guys. But we see the benefit, and we think people who need it the most need to get that medication. Hi, Michael. Um, my name is Michelle Ernie, and I own a home health company. Mm -hmm. My main concern in what I'm seeing is that um, drug interactions. Mm -hmm. So say I have a patient who is utilizing you know, this type of therapy. What type of, I guess, what type of things should I be looking for if they're taking medications and then they're taking this type of marijuana. Taking cannabis. Mm -hmm. Right. Is there any type of side effects or anything like that that I need to be aware of? Well, the two main side effects, I know this is going to be a shocker, dry mouth and hunger. So if you're dealing with your 90-year-old ladies, 
I strongly encourage them and the family members to consider that because the Megases of the world and the Marinol, Marinol, by the way, is synthetic THC. It doesn't work as well as natural uh, cannabis. Cannabis is, uh, it has what they call an entourage effect, which means it works better together as a whole plant. You know, God made the plant and he made it a certain way. Don't mess it up because it works. Um, one of the things that we have heard is there can be a slight de um, decrease in blood pressure. So it's something to where it's, it's, it's acute, so it doesn't happen uh, for long periods. But there can be certain times where somebody has a cardiac problem. You definitely want to make sure that they're talking to their physician and they understand that. But primarily, what I see is you have to see what, what benefits outweigh the consequences. Um, when you're dealing with side effects, a lot of times we, when the seniors, we see problems with the opiates. They can't go to the bathroom. They get constipated. Um, also, we see the Parkinson's and the, and the shuffling gait and so forth. You know, from a home health aspect, I look at, is this medication going to make them more mobile and be able to, to be more mobile? Because as you know, in home health, once they stop moving, you know, it's not good. So all these other problems start. So I kind of start on that aspect. And also I talk to them about educating them about dosing. Because the challenge with cannabis is one size doesn't fit all. One person could get relief from 20 milligrams of product. One person could have the same relief with 250 milligrams of product. So the biggest thing that I see is, is educating your staff. What is this? How does it work? And start tabulating data. Because what I see is a lot of home health companies specifically, they don't have any education. And I'd be more than happy to come talk to your home health group if you wanted me to kind of give an education. Because the, to what I find the nurses and the therapists, they want to help. They want to do stuff. They just don't know what to do. And they feel like they're going to get in trouble if they mention the word. Oh, my gosh, I said the word. We're going to get in trouble. I'm going to get fired. You know, so it's, it's you as an owner saying, we're open to this. We want to hear about it. How can we help this? Because... If you're a home health provider and you tell all your, your doctors that we support medical cannabis and we'll support your patients and anything you want to help us to help with when tabulating data, we can try to do that, you're going to get more patients. Because I showed you, three to 5,000 a week signing up. And that's going to go up to five to 7,000 a week now that flowers available. So you're going to have more and more people who are going to qualify. We have one more quick question. Okay. Uh, Mitchell Gordon. Uh, I'm glad to see that they're not making them use cash and they're, the municipalities are taking other forms. But they're very unstable cryptocurrencies. There's thousands of them. How is the municipality going to decide which one to take? Also, what's going to happen when a cryptocurrency, how, the best way to describe it is, each unit is worth $5,000 and they pay taxes, and then next year that unit is only worth $50. What's going to happen to, to the municipality? Well, and, and that's something we need to talk about afterwards because this could take all day. But basically... The tax structure, the, the way they did it in this specific state is um, it would be, it's called a stable coin, so it would be a set value, and so that's the way they can do it. And so there was a lot of legal ease that went behind that to where they got it approved. So it wasn't a, a coin like, a, it wasn't like a Bitcoin, so it was something that stayed stable, and that's the way they were able to get it approved. So we can, we can talk afterwards about that. Yes, there's a lot of questions, and we appreciate all of that. But uh, let's give Michael a great round of applause. Thank you very applause. much.